I'll put the document so we can start <clears throat> with the Yoga Sutras. We were at chapter three and we were covering the aspect of Samyama on the various chakras and other focal points. Just as a brief recap, we talked about in that last session about Samyama or absorption, deep concentration on the solar entrance, on the lunar entrance, as well as the immovable center, which I said were Ida, Pingala and Sushumna. As I also mentioned, that there are various interpretations and some of these talk about the solar entrance as being the sun, the lunar entrance being actually the heavenly body, the moon. Some refer to these as different parts of the body. You know that the navel center is often referred to also in lay person's terms as the solar plexus. And so those who have a bit of a medical background started assuming that the solar entrance was referring to this particular chakra, which it is not because that comes later. So a lot of different interpretations. Those of us who are coming from a meditative tradition, which our tradition is, we have a perspective which is, of course, based on practical experience, meditative experience. And here we, we say that this is, this is referring to various focal points in the body and chakras included. A lot of people refer sometimes to the Yoga Sutras and say, there is no Tantra in the Yoga Sutras. It is not a Tantric text. It may not be written in tantric terms like most tantric texts are written, but there is definitely tantra in the text. It's just that those who are scholars do not see it, those who are practitioners know it. For example, the very last word of the Yoga Sutras is the word Shakti, and Shakti is as tantra as it can get. We talked also about Samyama on the navel chakra, which is again very clear that uh, this is a point in the body. We talked about also the throat chakra, and that is where we stopped the last time at verse 3.31. Verse 3.31 says Samyama on the laryngeal cavity, the throat chakra leads to a sense of deep well-being and nurturing, stilling thirst and hunger. Some of you may wonder, how is it possible that by focusing the mind on the throat chakra, you can still thirst and hunger? A thirst and hunger is not just a physical symptom. It's also mental and psychological. These days we hear very often about food-related disorders and we know that this comes from personality and eating or not eating is a sort of a compensation or a reaction to a mental state. We know that, therefore, that food and mental state are very deeply connected. The throat chakra is the element space or akasha. This will come again and again. And akasha is receiving grace or unconditional love, nurturing satisfaction, contentment. This is about having a level of trust in the divine. 
And when we are able to focus on this chakra, samyama on this chakra means deep concentration, go deeper into it, we experience a sense of deep satisfaction, contentment. This is nurturing. This is grace. And when you have a sense of satisfaction and contentment, you have less desires. Thirst and hunger are actually physical symptoms of a mental state, of, of lack, of need. And when you experience deep love, and nurturing, you have less desire for external things. Those who do meditation at a deeper level, they will see, they will see immediately through uh, practice that they actually need much less food. Most of the time, when we are eating food, we are often trying to compensate for something that we lack. And so food, thirst, hunger is very deeply connected to the mind. And Samyama on the throat chakra is about deeper contentment and satisfaction. When you are able to stay at that level, open this chakra, we all have blockages at different levels in our chronic uh, body and when that opens up food becomes a means means to live and not the other way around you don't live to eat but you eat to live does that help in getting a understanding into how the throat chakra is related to thirst and hunger and experiencing a deeper feeling of well-being and nurturing. My effort is always to make it understandable in terms that we know and therefore I mentioned um, the issue of food-related disorders since that is becoming quite a common issue and we do know about it, that it is related to mind and personality. Verse 32 says, Calmness is attained by Samema on the tortoise-shaped tubular structure. Once again, a lot of interpretations and debates about this tortoise-shaped tubular structure, which is called the Kurmanari, and it is often called a nerve of, a, of some sort, and it refers to, in different commentaries, to different things. But those of you who know a little bit about the body, you know, that the diaphragm is a, shaped a bit like a tortoise. Some of you have already bought or read my book, Mastering Pranayam. Part one of Mastering Pranayam goes into a fair amount of detail about diaphragmatic breathing. It also has a diagram, and if you look at this diagram, you will see that it really does look a bit like a tortoise. It's a, it's a, it's like a half circle shape, and it's um, one of the most important muscles in the body. It's very powerful, very strong, and it's the most important. Uh, muscle required for optimizing the breath, for breathing. Now, 
when you are able to do samyama on this, it means that you are using your diaphragm and not the other more superficial methods of breathing, but deep diaphragmatic breathing. The moment you experience some sort of uh, agitation, if you are able in that moment to let your attention be with the diaphragm and focus on diaphragmatic breathing, you will notice immediately that the mind calms down. Mastering Pranayam Part 1 goes into a fair amount of detail about the relationship between the mind and the breath and vice versa, also about the diaphragm and its importance. So this verse really um, says nothing new in that sense, but for the times it was written in, you can imagine that it was really amazing that they knew about the diaphragm and its connection to the mind and that by breathing, deep diaphragmatic breathing leads to calmness. So these verses are referring to different focal points. When I talk about these different focal points here, I am not necessarily recommending any one of these focal points to any one of you. Some of you have written to me and asked me if they should be using one of these focal points, to which I say our tradition is a meditative tradition. It's also a tradition, it's called a guru, guru parampara, that means a guru shishya parampara means there is a student and teacher relationship and there's a preparation stage and then comes deeper practices. So for those of you who are with me, being guided by me, of course, you're prepared first and then step by step you're given different practices including different focal points. The focal points would differ depending on the person. So the Yoga Sutras is not a text which is uh, in the sense practical uh, in terms of giving practices to people. It is a synthesis. It is putting together all the different theory, theory as well as certain parts of practice together and it's a synthesis. So my advice to those of you who are reading the text, trying to understand it, that this is not a text where you will get instructions on practice. But you will definitely get a deeper understanding if you are already practicing. Any questions regarding diaphragmatic breathing, samyama on the kurmanari, or for that matter on the throat chakra? Verse 3.33 is very interesting. Samyama on the light of Guru Chakra under the crown of the head leads to glimpses of accomplishment or Siddhas, the accomplished ones. Verse 33 is talking about a light under the crown of the head. This is a reference to Guru Chakra. Now, I'm quite aware that for those of you who have a little bit of reading knowledge about chakras, 
you know that there are seven chakras and Guru Chakra is not one of those. Guru Chakra is one of the secret chakras and while there may be references to it somewhere in the internet these days, most people do not know much about this chakra. And the reason for that is that this chakra is experienced only by those who go deeper into meditation. And the word guru indicates it's a chakra of knowledge. When one knows how to invoke the Guru Chakra through a systematic practice, leads to glimpses of higher accomplishment. In our tradition, the student is prepared and one learns how to invoke the Guru Chakra Quite contrary to popular belief, invoking a chakra or invoking is not just merely saying a few mantras. It means preparation and then allowing the deeper unconscious mind to come forward. And this is not achieved by merely repeating a few mantras. This requires a great deal of preparation, systematic preparation. Many people think that the Ajya Chakra is a very advanced stage, but the word Ajya, Jnya means knowledge, and A is a negation. In reality, Ajna Chakra is not the chakra of knowledge, it is the opposite. It keeps us bound in this worldly plane. To get to the Guru Chakra, the true chakra of knowledge, one must pass the Ajra Chakra, which is a gateway or uh, which uh, a gateway to the Guru Chakra, or you can see it as a, a fortress almost, which prevents you from reaching the Guru Chakra. When we are able to pass the Guru Chakra, sorry, the Arjuna Chakra, and move towards the Guru Chakra, we enter the realms of the active unconscious mind and the latent unconscious mind. We can use our diagram here. So we would be referring here now, moving from the conscious mind inwards to the active unconscious mind and to the latent unconscious mind. So of course in this diagram I cannot show you the Guru Chakra, but what this means in practice is that you begin to get access into these two layers. And when that happens, you come in touch with beings which are disembodied, and those at a mac in the macrocosm, this here is the microcosm, the individual, and there is a macrocosm, which is at this level of the active unconscious mind. Here, the beings, the disembodied beings who have consciously left their body and are working out their samskaras at this level are called jivan mukts. And those who are working out their karma and samskaras at this level of the latent unconscious mind are called siddhas. So when you 
are able to go through, see the light of the Guru Chakra, have these meditative experiences, you will come in touch with these, I call them celestial beings. They are Jivan Moks and Siddhas, disembodied beings. And this is a sign of great accomplishment. Such a person can become himself, herself, a Jivan Mokt or a Siddha. So this is about the Guru Chakra, verse 33. What happens after you have come in touch with this light of the Guru Chakra? One attains Pratibha, infinite wisdom to which all is known. When you have experienced this it is like an opening, it's like the floodgates open and you have access now to the unconscious mind. The unconscious mind is just another word for Kundalini. This is a power and those who accidentally stumble upon this power do not know how to use it can suffer but those who consciously practice this and know how to regulate this power they also have access to this infinite wisdom known as pratibha where is this infinite wisdom coming from it comes from From here, from the center of consciousness. Imagine that this is like a wall here, this part here. And in our normal state, we have no awareness of the active and the unconscious mind. We are like split personalities. So right now, you are not conscious of what is happening in your active and latent unconscious mind. When you go to bed at night, you have dreams which are from your active unconscious mind. You go into deep sleep and rest in the latent unconscious mind where all your samskaras are like seeds. They have the potential but they are not active. Now, through meditation, there is an opening suddenly here and you are able to see all this here. You can go through. And the light from here also shines down here. So you receive also a flood of wisdom which is coming from the center of consciousness. This infinite wisdom through which all is known, does that mean that you know everything in terms of information? No. This is not referring to knowledge which is sensory. It's, not, it's knowledge beyond the senses. It's wisdom. It's intuition. We know that we all are connected at that level. Pure consciousness is in me, is in all of you. And at that level, we are connected. So, when we have access to that level of pure consciousness, it stands to reason that we also have access to an intuition which is all-encompassing. And that is Pratipa, this infinite wisdom.
All right. So any questions regarding this? Pratibha is also known as Tarak. Tarak is intuition. Last year, I did a retreat with the mentoring program. Mentoring program is uh, for those of uh, my students who are very close to me, who I have been guiding and training for many years now. And we went to a shrine in the Himalayas known as Tarkeshwar. Tark, Tarkeshwar is the lord of Tarak, the lord of intuition. Verse 3.35. This is the last of the verses referring to certain focal points. And the last one is Samyama on the heart chakra leads to direct awareness of Chitta, the storehouse of samskaras. Now, when it refers to Samyama on the heart, I have put chakra in brackets because, of course, it's not referring to the heart as in the physical organ. It's not even referring to the heart as a physical space. Uh, on the surface, but to the chakra itself. Chakras are chronic vehicles or channels, and these are not to be mistaken with nerves. Nerves are something else. In my book, Mastering Pranayam, especially in chapter, sorry, in part two, which is about the advanced pranayam goes into some detail of the nature of pranic channels and the meaning of the chakras. So the chakras are like, if you imagine a country which has got many highways crisscrossing the country, you know that bigger cities, there will be more motorways or highways leading out of these big cities and leading into these big cities, or airports or other places of national importance. So the chakras are like a intersection of pranic channels. And one of the very important ones is the heart chakra. The heart is also the seat of the latent unconscious mind. Just as the throat is the seat of the active unconscious mind. The heart is the seat of latent unconscious mind, which means all the samskaras which are still in their seed form, in the potential form. And when you are able to be absorbed in the heart chakra, it will lead to the awareness of the entire chitta, the reservoir of samskaras known in the Yoga Sutras as Karmasaya. This means you really get to know yourself, who you are, what is your nature. You get to know the mind. And deep, very deep in the mind itself, in the latent unconscious mind, is pure consciousness. In our diagram, it was shown to be behind. That's the limitations of diagrams. But pure consciousness is in a bed of samskaras, latent unconscious mind. So as you meditate on the heart chakra, it's again an opening like a floodgate and deeper awareness of 
your deepest desires, deepest fears, the root, the very root of this eternal tree. You know that the beginning of the sessions, we always see that diagram, which I put up here again. And we see that the roots of this tree are in the latent unconscious mind. And so, when you go to the heart of the matter, we are referring to the latent unconscious mind, which is in terms of prana located in the heart chakra. Any questions, thoughts about the different focal points? Samima leads to knowing yourself, understanding the microcosm. And when you understand the microcosm, you understand the macrocosm. Know yourself to know the world. Yes, Lucia, you wanted to see the diagram with the, the eternal tree, I presume. So, Lucia and Raphael, there you go. Yes, so it is the same diagram as the other one that you always see. This is the yogic anatomy. It's just been turned upside down to make it fit with the concept of a tree. In the Bhagavad Gita, one refers to the tree with the roots above and branches below. What is that tree? This is the tree. The tree is referring to the body, the mind, the unconscious mind, and the immortal self. And so the branches are the body and the senses. With the, the conscious and the active unconscious mind are like the trunk of the tree, and the latent unconscious mind is like the roots of the tree. So please remember that these focal points should be given by a teacher, preferably of a meditative tradition. Selecting these from books or lectures is not necessarily helpful. And may even be, in the best case, a waste of time. Because before one takes up practices, using any of these focal points, one requires a great deal of preparation. So we continue to verses 36-37, which is about Samyama on Purusha. So having done the Part about the heart, we, we have come to the heart of the matter, and as I said, that in the heart, or you can say in the latent unconscious mind, buried in there, is pure consciousness. So naturally, the next step is Samyama on Purusha. Purusha is just another word for individual self or for pure consciousness. Verse 36. One experiences bhoga, bhoga is pain and pleasure, due to the inability to distinguish between buddhi and purusha. Direct knowledge of purusha is, required, is acquired with samyama on purusha itself. We all experiencing pain and pleasure all the time. This is bhoga. This is the result of your samskaras, which you saw are in the reservoir of the active and latent unconscious mind. And this is causing all our pain and pleasure. 
And this experience is due to the fact that we are unable to tell the difference between pure consciousness and between buddhi. Now, this may be a bit of a surprise for some of you. In our tradition, we often say buddhi is really very important. Buddhi is that voice of wisdom in you. It's the most sattvic part in you. So we have been told there is manas, buddhi, chitta and ahankara. Ahankara seems to have got the image of being the bad boy. It is not. It is merely a set of identities. Some are useful and some are not useful. Manas is that part which relates to the world. It's like an interface. And the senses are coordinated by manas. Chitta is the storehouse of memories, desires, fears, emotions. And buddhi, we always said, was the voice of wisdom. So why is it now that buddhi is suddenly um, almost sounds like it's not such a great thing? Because buddhi is still a part of the mind. Buddhi is sattvic. It's the closest thing to pure consciousness. But it is not pure consciousness. And then we hear this voice of wisdom in us, talking to us and telling us how we should act, giving us guidance from within. We follow this guidance and we trust this. And then you're shaken up and you're told, even this is not it. There's something deeper, and that is Purusha, your consciousness. And we are not able to distinguish between the two. And this is what is leading to our pain and pleasure, this continuous experiences. So for direct knowledge of Purusha, direct knowledge of Purusha is required, is acquired with Samyama and Purusha itself. Therefore, only the self knows the self. This is a very important sutra. We learn that knowledge of the self is only acquired with samyama on the self. The mind cannot know the self. Let's take the example of a dark room. If the room is dark, how do I know what is in the room? I have to switch on the light. So now the light illuminates the room, but the same light also illuminates itself. The dark room cannot illuminate the light. So also, it is Purusha which is illuminating the mind. The mind cannot illuminate Purusha. So to know the self, you have to do samyama on the self. Only the self knows the self. Those on the meditative path who are practicing, they should be aware that while buddhi is very useful, it is not the end. We say from the Yoga Vashishta, for example, you take a thorn to remove a thorn from your foot. You know, when you, how do you remove the thorn? You take another thorn and take it out. You remove that thorn. So also, it's the mind which will liberate itself from the mind. So we need to have buddhi. Buddhi is useful, but buddhi is not the end. Buddhi serves pure consciousness. Thus, 
37. From the direct knowledge of Purusha arises Pratibha and the super normal powers of hearing, touch, sight, taste and smell. Now, with the direct knowledge of your consciousness, you become a witness. And this leads to many superpowers because Pratibha rises. Once again, we talk about Pratibha or Tarak. This is knowledge, infinite knowledge, access to this. Because now you have access to pure consciousness. So, Pratibha is knowledge which is very subtle, knowledge of the past, knowledge of the future. All this is intuition. What does happen also with the powers of hearing, touch, taste, smell, they seem to be magnified because as a witness, one who is established in Purusha has experiences a tremendous expansion of awareness. It is a complete expansion of awareness and therefore the kind of hearing, the kind of smell, touch, sight, everything is so expanded that a person with a normal average awareness will only be shocked by this, it cannot relate to this. I often narrate the story of a mother and child and I say that Imagine the child is wanting to eat some forbidden sweets and, you know, the child climbs up on the kitchen chair with a chair and is trying to take out from the shelves above some sweets very quietly, secretly. When mother is sitting in the living room or is in the bedroom and... Uh, Suddenly the child hears the mother saying, I can, I know what you're doing. Get down from there. It's very dangerous. You'll fall and hurt yourself. And the child wonders, how did mother know? How did mother know that I am trying to steal the sweets here? Gets a shock. What the child doesn't know is, because the child doesn't have that sense of awareness, that the mother can see the child perhaps from a mirror or a reflection in the window. The child imagines, oh, mother has got some special magic powers. And maybe the mother also humors the child and says, yes, yes, I have magic powers and I can see through walls. In reality, what has happened is merely that the child doesn't have that awareness that the mother has that every adult has. So also, practitioners have expanded their consciousness, have simply a greater field of awareness than the average person. So this was Samyama on Purusha. Now we talk about obstacles versus attainment, verse 38. These powers are obstacles to samadhi, though considered to be powers in an outward moving mind. This is exactly what I referred to when I said about the child and the mother. Child thought, oh wow, what amazing powers mother has. She can do magic. I also want to be like that. And we think when we will think of these powers and say, oh, this is worth having. I'd like to have these. But 
to have these powers, you expand your awareness, but it also means that you need to do samyama on some of these focal points. And if you're doing samyama on these focal points merely for those powers, then you are putting your energy in something else rather than putting your energy into realizing the self. So those powers which come as a byproduct, that's fine. But if you put your energy only into getting these powers, you are likely to fail. It will become an obstacle. So for those who are really attaining, aspiring to attain samadhi, all these powers should be viewed as obstacles. Why is that so? Because as long as there's samskaras in the mind, you saw that they are the roots. As long as the, the roots have not been removed, the plant can grow again, right? So as long as there are samskaras, you have not had total liberation, there is always a chance of falling back into suffering and misery. So a practitioner has to be very alert all the time. That he does not get lost in pursuing powers instead of focusing his energy on liberation, purifying the mind. Any questions referring to obstacle versus attainment? The next three verses are about Samyama and Prana. So we know that there are different kinds of prana, known as pranavayu, and verse 39 says, with the attenu attenuation of the cause of bondage, and upon acquiring the knowledge of channels, the mind can enter another body. What is the cause of bondage? The samskaras. So as the samskaras are purified, they are not that strong, they have been attenuated or they have some of them have been burnt already in the fire of knowledge. So as the person gets more free from all these kleshas, he acquires the knowledge of channels. Which channels? The pranic channels. Such a person's mind can enter another body. Now the mind enters and leaves the body through a particular channel, which is known as Brahmanari. Those of you who are in a meditative tradition or in our tradition know that it is possible to leave the body consciously. And that is something we aspire to do when dying, to die consciously. Now, this is also a power to be able to leave the body and re-enter the body. When you know through meditation, through direct experience, this channel and have had enough practice that you can do it at will, on command, to do it consciously. Just remember that pranic channels are not nerves. They are subtler energy channels. In the, some of you may be knowing the story of Adi Shankara. He was a great teacher, one of the teachers of our tradition. And the story was that he was able to leave his body consciously enter the body of another person 
experience the life of a householder through the body of a king and then enter back into his own body. So these channels, pranic channels, are not nerves. To give you an example, it's a bit like an electric wire. The wire is a bit like a nerve. It's, it's located in the physical body. But the prana is like electricity. And so the flow of electricity is different from an electric wire, right? So prana is, this pranic channel is the flow of prana and not some nerve or physical, uh, in the physical body. Mm. Jenny Lowe says, is that nadis? I I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, nadis. We are talking about channels, yes, that is nadis, but here we are talking about specific nadis, which are of great importance. There are thousands of nadis, there are over 72,000 nadis according to the scriptures, and most of them are not really relevant. It is specifically three nadis are of importance Ida, Pingala, and Sushumna. Sushumna then further moves into or turns into what is known as Brahmanadi. Radhika ji? Yes, Manisha? I have a question. Yeah. So about consciously leaving the body, mm -hmm. as in the story you have just shared, mm -hmm. can you um, relate this to our concepts of like empathy and compassion or, or maybe the question really is, you know, why would one want to do that in this case the story is of, of leaving and returning mm -hmm. um, so can you the it's very difficult for me to put into words but uh, maybe just from here you can jump and share something more mm -hmm. um, yes the, the story I mentioned about Adi Shankara uh, is a very specific story with regard to the fact that Adi Shankara was a monk and uh, he was challenged in a debate uh, with householders who said, how can you talk about spiritual life as a householder because you have never been one? So he says, okay, I will do something about that and come back with the experience of a householder. Which is why he uses this practice to leave his body consciously and while he, so the legend says that while he left his body his his physical body was guarded by his students and his body remained as it is was protected by them and the mind traveled into the body of a king who had just died and this king then came back to life it was actually Adi Shankara, who enjoyed the life of a householder. And when he had, had uh, gathered enough experience, he returned. I'm not telling the full story, of course. The full story was that he, in fact, lost, got lost in the pleasures and pain of the life of a householder. And he forgot who he was. And another student came to remind him of who he was. And then he left the body of the king and returned. In this case, it is about having certain desires and to fulfill that desire. So possibly if you have a body that is broken, old, and you still have certain desires to fulfill, and at the same time, you have the ability to leave the body consciously, then such a mind could enter another body, live out those samskaras, 
and then be fully liberated. That is one aspect. The other aspect is of leaving the body consciously at death. This helps us, if we are able to do that, to leave the body consciously at death, to become a Jivan Mukt or a Siddha. That means you have entered the state of Nirvikalp Samadhi and you do not need to return to this physical plane in and out the body. You can work out your subtle karma in the uh, disembodied planes at the microcosm level as Jivan Mokta or as a Siddha. I'm not sure if that has been of any <laughs> use <laughs> or, or helpful in any way, Anisha. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay. Good. Some of these are stories that, legends that defy imagination. The verses also uh, defy imagination and our understanding. From a scientific point of view, this would be considered mumbo jumbo. I guess, but these kind of miracles, so to say, have been recorded even by the British who were in India for almost 200 years. They recorded um, many such uh, amazing activities or experiences which they were able to see um, during their years there. Some of them are even uh, in the Museum of War, I believe it is called, in London. For example, the story of a, of a yogi who had himself buried underground and in the presence of two British officers and they placed guards over there for one year and after one year, they dug him out and he emerged totally healthy out of this kind of cave uh, underground where he had nothing, no food, no water, no, no air, nothing. And um, there are many such examples being recorded during that time. So... Um, Yes, in fact, verse 40 would have been about this very example that I mentioned right now, about mastering Udiyan, the upward moving prana. But I think we will continue next time. We maybe need this time to let these incredible ideas sink in. Whether you believe or not actually does not matter. What does matter is that we believe that there are certain things that we cannot understand, like the little child who thought that mother had some special powers and uh, know that when we are able to expand our consciousness further, there are many more realms there that we currently do not know how to explore. Okay, so have a nice weekend, everybody, and see you next time. Bye bye. Bye bye, Perry. Bye, John. Bye bye, Nita. Bye, Jenny. Bye, everyone. Anisha, Debbie, Lucia, and Rafael. Bye bye, everyone.